Is it time? It's time. Mm -hmm. It's time. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good morning. Welcome, welcome to this morning service. Um, outside here, even though it's a little bit chilly, uh, in the yard at our church. Uh, for those of you online, this is the Sunday morning service. What is it? It's September 27th at Osceola United Methodist Church in Osceola, Wisconsin. I'm Jack Starr, and I get to be the pastor here. And so we welcome you online uh, with us this morning, as well as we welcome a fairly small group in the yard with us. Um, actually, you can't hear it if you're in the car with the radio without your radio on, but if you would turn your radio on, at 99.3, we have a... Um, a close distance FM signal so that in the parking lot or even possibly the parking lot across the street you can pick up our service so that's a way for you to be in your car and still be able to uh, to hear us to join us with the service let's begin our service though by singing and we get to sing those of us who are gathered here we're in masks we're distanced we're outside and so we're gonna we feel free that we can sing this morning Let's sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Amen. Uh, let us let us uh, say together our call to worship, our centering prayer, as we focus our hearts and our minds on God. Eternal God, we open our minds and our hearts to you this hour. Turn us toward you and awaken us to your spirit for this time and even after we have left this place. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's join in singing Victory in Jesus. And the uh, words are in the songbook or in the song sheet that you have, uh, in the bulletin sheet that you have here. And uh, you can sing along if you know the words. A lot of people already know those words if you're online. So, um, Or if you happen to have a United Methodist hymnal at your home, it's number 370. Uh, Victory in Jesus.
A few moments of prayer this morning. We have some uh, prayer requests um, that that I've been given, and I have one addition to note and answer to prayer. Darlene is home from the hospital. Um, she uh, had some care and some surgery um, related to her fall and. Um, she is, uh, the doctors are really impressed with her health and her ability to recover, and so she is home recovering now. And so that's a blessing. Um, there are a few others, but let us join in prayer. And I'll follow, we'll follow the guided prayer outline uh, that we have here. I'm going to, um, and then as I come to the, each of each point, I'll give you a moment just to pray of those who are in your heart. And... Uh, and then I'll say, Lord, in your love, and I invite you all to say, Lord, hear this, our prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for your blessing, for keeping us, keeping us through the challenges of these days. Lord, we have so many things to be thankful for, and yet we come to you asking for more because you invite us to come and ask for more. We ask for blessings on ourselves, on our loved ones, on our communities, on so many things. But Lord, you want to pour out your blessing. And so here we are. Thank you for the opportunity to pray, to pray wherever we are, whatever we're doing. And thank you that we can pray together as we do this morning. And so Lord, we pray for all of those this morning who have suffered loss. Lord, in your love, hear this our prayer. We pray for all those who have died, who are facing death, and we pray for the loved ones of those who have passed on. Lord, in your love, we pray for those who are ill, who are in chronic pain, for those who are recovering from illness or procedures and those who are facing them. There are so many of those. Lord, in your love, hear this hour. We pray for those who are in transition and are facing uncertainty and that is so many in these days. Lord, in your love, we pray for those who are in danger of fire, flood, famine, disease, disaster, and violence. Lord, we pray for all who suffer. Lord, in your love, and we pray for those who serve, for our teachers, for the medical staff, police and firefighters, EMTs, for the military, for those who keep our services running. Lord, we ask you to keep them. Lord, in your love, hear this hour. We pray for the leaders of our government, of our community institutions, 
of our businesses and organizations. We pray for their wisdom as they make decisions, for their grace and compassion. Touch their hearts, Lord, all those who shape our world. Lord, in your love. And finally, Lord, we want to recognize that we have received many answers to prayer. And so we lift up all those to you who have experienced blessing and who see answers to their prayers. Lord, in your love, we are a blessed people, Lord. You are the one who has made us blessed. We pray that the blessings that we receive will flow from us out to our neighbors, our families, to our community, all of those with whom we have contact. And Lord, we pray that you will expand our hearts, that we may continue to reach out to more and more people in your grace and your love. Let us be witnesses in everything we say and do and who we are. We pray all of this in Jesus' name as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture today is from Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Ah, sorry about that. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Sorry. Oh, okay. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. May God give his blessing to the hearing and understanding of this portion of scripture. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you. Last winter in spring, our midweek study group was using a book called Beatitudes from the Backside by Ellsworth Callis. Um, Callis had written a series of backside books, including parables from the backside, which we are having great fun with this fall. A little bit of a plug for that Bible study. It's Wednesdays at one o'clock in the afternoon and all are welcome. It is, um, it is live in person here at the church we spread out, we wear masks, and we have great fun in our discussion. But that's parables from the backside. Anyway, um, in Callus's series of books, uh, he tries to consider well-known parts of the Bible from a different point of view. He hesitated on writing the Be one on the Beatitudes, he said, though, because, well, as he tells us, the Beatitudes are already from the backside. 
They turn our understanding of the world upside down. They make us think about our world in new ways. If we approach the Beatitudes as they appear in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, we discover within the first sentence that we are looking at things in a manner that is utterly at odds with our usual outlook on life. The Beatitudes are just contrary to the way most people look at life, the way we usually live our lives and the way we understand the world. But they are worth exploring because they describe realities about the kingdom of heaven that are fundamental. So here in the Beatitudes, um, we have both a preview of the sermon and a summary of the Sermon on the Mount, because these are the opening verses of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount that we find in Matthew 5 through 7. And in this sermon, Jesus is introducing his upside-down kingdom. Upside down kingdom. What I mean by that is this is a realm in which the first shall be last and the last first. This is a realm in which in order to save your life, you have to give it up. This is a realm in which real power comes not from coercion or power itself, but there is power in love. That real safety comes in vulnerability and the way to freedom is dependence on God and not on ourselves. This is not the way the world works as we know it. And we've seen it. But in these radical words, we're told that the way to your own happiness is to selflessly pursue happiness for others. And that's what the Beatitudes are all about, happiness. In fact, um, the word blessed, which is the first of each of the Beatitudes, the first word of each of that the Beatitudes. In Hebrew, the word is hesed, but in Greek, the word that is used is makarios, which means superabundant joy. It means really happy. It means happy in a way that we would not expect. And this description, this passage is a description of what is overwhelmingly joyful, and it's a prescription for indescribable happiness. The only thing is that when we read what is supposed to make us so happy, it's nothing like what we expect. And perhaps the very first one of the Beatitudes is the one that is the most shocking, um, especially if we understood the whole meaning of that. The first one, blessed, happy, uh, are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in order to get just the right sense of this, I want to go back into the previous chapter uh, and just read a couple of verses to show what is leading. Before Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down to teach, here's what was going on. Uh, so I, I saw a couple went into cars. Just a reminder, this morning with our, our FM, it's 99.3 is what you need to do to, uh, to pick us up on your FM radio. Okay, let's go back. I want to read just this section out of chapter 4. Matthew 4, starting with verse 23. That Jesus went throughout the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. And news about him spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering from pain, who were demon-possessed, those having seizures, those paralyzed. And he healed them. And then it says, large crowds from the Decapolis, from Galilee, from Jerusalem and Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. And when Jesus saw this crowd, he went up on the mountainside and sat down, and then his disciples came to him and he began to teach them. That's the introduction. That's the setting for where Jesus is delivering the Beatitudes. He'd been preaching and teaching and healing, and those who he touched came to hear his message. So the key to looking at this Sermon on the Mount is to look at this audience, this crowd. Who are the people who came to hear this? Who are the people that he's looking out in the crowd at as he is speaking? And here we hear that it is a large and a very diverse crowd from very different areas. Galilee is a very Jewish area. Um, even militantly so. 
From Galilee is where some of the rebellious groups, the zealots, actually had their formulation. They came out of the area of Galilee. The Decapolis, is to, right next to the Galilee, is a very Greek area. It was founded by Alexander the Great. Those were Greek settlements within, um, within Palestine. And, and the Decapolis is about as opposite as Galilee as you can get. They're not Jewish. They're not religious. They're not pure or clean or holy or follow any of the scripture commands. So it's folks from the Decapolis. Already you've got great extremes in variation. You've got people who come from Jerusalem and from Judea. This is where the government and the religious center is. This is the place that looks down on all the other regions because none of them are nearly as sophisticated as we are from Jerusalem. And then he caps it saying, and there are people who came from across the, across the Jordan River. These are the wild countries. This is the pagan homeland. This is, this is the place of nomads and, and um, um, you know, again, very separate from your normal, uh, the normal people that you would expect from Jerusalem and Judea. And so it says when, when Jesus saw this crowd, this crowd of all sorts of people from different backgrounds, people who would have been from their birth told that they should have nothing to do with some of the others who were sitting right next to them. They're all here together. And so he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for those is the kingdom of heaven. A crowd of sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes and priests, pagans, really religious people and Gentile people who aren't considered remotely religious by the really religious people. A wide spectrum of humanity. And to this crowd, Jesus begins with blessed are the poor in spirit. Because the kingdom of God belongs to them. It's pouring out on them. It's falling on them. It's, it's there. It's embraced them. The only thing is, looking at that phrase, poor in spirit, it's not a good thing to be poor in spirit. Poor in spirit is not something that you would attain to, that you would aspire to, that you would hope to achieve. Oh boy, I hope I can become poor in spirit. The poor in spirit are the losers. Losers in just about every way. Bankrupt, financially, socially, morally. These aren't the noble poor. These are the ones who have absolutely nothing to their credit. They're the ones without any trace of good, the destitute, the pathetic. Now in Greek, um, the language that our New Testament originally came to us, in Greek there are two words for, for poor. One of them, penne, describes a worker, one who is not rich, but who's not destitute either, would be the working poor. Minimum wage type, a hard worker. They're, they maybe are barely getting by, but they are hard getting by. That's not the word used here. The word that is used here is patokos, which describes absolute and abject poverty. These are the ones who are on their street. Patokos describes one who is who's nothing at all, nothing to their credit, absolutely destitute. And that's not a condition anyone aspires to. But what Jesus is doing here is just brilliant. He's trying to shock us with something that is so upside down, so shocking. In, in fact, on one hand, it's almost offensive at what he's saying. And on maybe another comforting. And, let, and, and all of this is happening there, so it takes just a little bit to, to actually absorb what he's doing. And so I want to hit two of the points that, that I've already mentioned before. One is that poor in spirit is not something to desire. It's not something to try to become. There's nothing praised, worthy, honorable, good um, about being poor in spirit. It's not a condition to be proud of. Um, and the second is that there's more going on when Jesus says blessed. I've already said that blessed means happy, superabundant joy, but it also contains with that an understanding that blessed means you are happy because God is with you. God's face 
has smiled upon you. It's God's way of saying, I'm on your side. And that's the way it's used in Scripture. That's the way Jesus uses it in other teachings as well. It's a, a holistic, epic statement. You're fortunate because God's with you. Whatever your state, whatever your situation, whether you're depraved, deprived, losers, or pathetic, you're fortunate because God is on your side. Now, Jesus is making an announcement here. He's not giving instructions. He's not telling us, here's how to get God's blessing and seven easy lessons. He's not giving us guidelines for hoops for us to jump through. That's not at all what the Beatitudes are. They're announcements. Jesus is announcing that God is on the side of those right now who have no reason for God to care for them. And that's fundamentally counterintuitive because we're inclined to think, okay, okay, what's so blessed about this condition that deserves the blessing of God? And maybe we're even thinking of, okay, what is it about this condition? We want to we wanna be blessed by God. We want to be part of the kingdom of heaven. So what do I have to do? How do I have to become poor in spirit? What did I need to do? And because, because you know, that's how religion works. You know, religion is, is actually where we're saying, okay, what measure do I need to attain in order for God to smile on me? And Jesus is saying, well, that's not work. That's not what I'm doing here. We want a measurable criteria. We want it to fit into our understanding of reality, and that is that nothing comes from nothing. Nothing, you get nothing for free. You get what you earn. So we're saying what criteria now has to be met in order for me to achieve this blessing of the kingdom? But the announcement is that it comes for those who have nothing to offer, nothing to their credit. Blessed are all the people who aren't humble, who aren't obedient or loyal or reverent. I think of the Scout Law. I was not a very good Boy Scout, but I still remember the Scout Law. Uh, Scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. This announcement isn't for them. Jesus is saying, you don't need to be any of that stuff to be part of the kingdom of God. And, and that takes a bit to wrap our heads around it. But that is gospel. It's a little bit confrontative. It's a little bit disturbing, isn't it, for religious people? Because it's so easy for us to be convinced that God's blessing is on us because of something we are or something that we said or something that we've done. But no, blessed are the people for whom there is no reason to bless. It's not about us. It's not about our resumes. And, and we're thinking, wait, okay, why? I mean, why would we do this? Because we need reasons. Only Jesus doesn't do so well with all the whys. If you go through the stories, you'll find his answer is so often because. I mean, because God's like us. Because God is like this. And Jesus tells us this story after story where there isn't any explanation given. And there doesn't seem to be any point to the story other than to show us this is what God is like. In Luke 14, where the king throws a wonderful party and invites all of his friends who don't come, and so he invites people from the street, why is he giving a party? Because. Why does he invite the street people? Because. Why does Jesus heal the lepers in Luke 17? It doesn't give us any reason. Sometimes in the Bible it says, in the stories, it says Jesus felt compassion and he healed them. But many times it just says Jesus healed them. Why? Because. Why does Jesus have to stay at the house of the little short man Zacchaeus? He doesn't give a reason. He just says, Zacchaeus, I must stay at your house today. Endlessly you find grace favor, fellowship, and embrace for no reason at all except that God is like that. 
That's what Jesus is teaching us. And so to this potluck of humanity here on the hillside, all these people with different religious views and worldviews and practices and gods, Jesus announces that the blessing of God is yours. Why? Because God's like that. So blessed are the pure in spirit, those with the wrong religion, those without any religion, those who don't believe the right things, those who haven't kept the covenant, those who have really, really screwed it up in an endless variety of ways. Hear this, Jesus says, God is on your side. To all of those, all of you who don't believe the blessing, who don't deserve the blessing of God, hear this. The blessing of God is here and it's yours. This is good news. This is gospel. This is grace. But like most people, I still struggle with that. We're thinking, wait, don't don't I deserve a little credit for what I bring to the table? I mean, for the laws, for the rules I've kept? I mean, I'm better than average. That's the deal, isn't it? God blesses the hardworking. God blesses the morally upright. God blesses those who make right decisions and the people who are doing the right things at the right time. God blesses people who make the right confession of faith, go to the right schools, who work hard, who keep their noses clean. That's who the favor of God is for, right? But the thing is, as soon as we say that, we're saying that God's love is for those who can earn it. And there's nothing in the gospel that says that. As soon as we start thinking about what we can bring to the table, about what we can earn, how we earn God's love, then we start thinking about those people who don't earn it quite so much as I do. Those who don't bring quite so much to the table. And the minute we look down on somebody because they aren't as disciplined or hardworking or smart, as responsible or moral or God-fearing or Bible-believing or Jesus-trusting as we are because they've made all kinds of stupid, idiotic decisions. At that moment, we are in fact claiming to be rich in spirit. And Jesus isn't announcing anything to us. But it's good news if we recognize ourselves as a part of that group the depraved, the deprived, the pathetic. As soon as we recognize that what I bring to the table has no more value than what anybody else brings, the gospel is the announcement that in our pathetic, bedraggled, confused, morally ambiguous state in which there is nothing good within you, God says, I'm on your side. When he says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, to judge the world, but to save it. When he says that, he means all the world. If you've ever thought, well, I'm out. The creator of the universe couldn't have time for someone who doesn't get it right. Jesus is saying, no, wait, it doesn't work that way. Jesus is saying, know this. This verse about God's blessing, about God's love for the world, is for you. You don't have to earn it. You can't, in fact, earn it. You simply need to stand in awe of it. It's an announcement that in God's love, the kingdom of heaven has become absolutely available in a fresh new way for people who have no claim to it, who don't deserve it. And maybe that's something that the church, that our church needs to lift up. It's, it needs to be a place where we push back on the pervasive understanding, this understanding of, yeah, God loves you and there's a place for you as soon as you can measure up. Maybe in our words, in our actions, in the ways we interact with the community, we need to be echoing that counterintuitive announcement that no matter who you are, no matter where you've done, where you've been, no matter what you have done, God is on your side.
failure, unfaithfulness, addictions, abuse, corruption, that all part of your life? God is with you. Republican or Democrat, rich or poor, likable or not very likable, God is for you. The kingdom of heaven is available to you. Blessed are the poor in spirit because there is a place at the table even for us. Jesus stands in the midst of a crowd and announces that blessed are all the losers, the pathetic, destitute, spiritually and otherwise, all those who are sure that the blessing is for someone else. The kingdom of heaven is yours. That's gospel. That's grace. That's the good news for us. It's a simple announcement of grace for all who are poor in spirit. And it is enough. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for that blessing. It is hard for us to understand it because we so want to depend on our righteousness, on what we bring to the table, but we realize that it is only through you. We need to trust you. Help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing. It's one of the things, as I said, it's hard for us to accept, it's hard for us to see. Why don't we sing, Open My Eyes That I May See. folks came today some dropped offerings into the box there um, those of you who are at home I invite you to continue to support the ministry of our church by your mail-in offerings thank you so much for that uh, thank you for thank you to all of you for living out the gospel even in this time when it's so challenged we don't pass the plates now, but I do want to offer a prayer of dedication and blessing on all those gifts. Um, all of those things that, um, in our response to God's grace to us, that we have wanted to offer. Let's pray. Um, I invite those of you who are here with us, let's pray it in unison. The prayer of dedication for our gifts. Gracious God, bless these gifts that they may be signs of your redemption 
and your hope to a world in need. Bless our lives that we may shine with your glory and light up the world with your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A couple of quick announcements, uh, if I remember everything. I mentioned already that there is the Bible study that happens Wednesday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Um, next Sunday, this is the one probably going to take a little bit more to talk about. Next Sunday, the church service is at 10 o'clock. We've been doing it at 9 o'clock, so we can all be nice and, and chilly out here. But um, uh, we'll be at 10 o'clock and it will be indoors. Next Sunday, it will be a communion service. We're inviting people to bring a tablecloth, to bring a favorite bowl or a cup. We're going to have communion, and you'll be able to drip, dip the bread in your own cup. And we're going to be seating people in family groups. And so we'll seat you at a little table in the fellowship hall and around the sanctuary. And so it's World Communion Sunday, and the world sort of begins in our family. Um, even if it's a family one, then a family of one. And then we're thinking of the wider family, the family of our church that will be meeting here. And then on a World Communion Sunday, we think um, in a much wider sense, the family of all of God's people around the world. And so that will be our service next week. It will be indoors at 10 o'clock. And uh, for the remainder of this fall, we'll be at 10 o'clock. So we'll be having our services and we'll We'll be thinking about, are we indoors? Are we outdoors? Um, we'll be seeing, or are we just online? And some of this is still up in the air, as is all of our world now. So um, we invite you to keep in touch with our, with our communications as we do that. Um, I don't think there are any others from, oh, I do wanna remind you, the, there are notes in our newsletter about the reading program. And uh, the UMW has a wonderful reading program. There are lists of some of the books that are part of that. Let's do, um, invite you to read books. And here's some great recommendations. Cheryl, is there anything more to say? No, so invite you to do that. We've, oh, Dan. Confirmation Wednesday? Confirmation, this Wednesday at, um, the confirmation group is meeting at Seven o'clock is when, when we said we'd be doing that for a short meeting, getting back on track for this fall as we meet with our confirmation students. So that's that's this Wednesday. And, and today it's the last Sunday for our fresh start where we're collecting items to help people establish their new apartments, those who are moving from homeless shelters into a new apartment. And so we're collecting some items uh, this is the last one. We'll be bringing that to Grace Place in New Richmond so that um, so that they can make these gifts to folks who are getting started out, show them a little bit of love and encouragement. Uh, our charge conference is coming up on October 10th at 11 o'clock in the morning. It will be a Zoom, though there will be a, a an in-person presence here if you need to be part of that. And so it's our charge conference business meeting so invite you to come to that why don't we here stand at home you can stand too in the yard let's stand here for our benediction and now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may the love of God our eternal Father and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever amen Let's sing Give Thanks with a grateful heart as we close our service. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son give thanks with a grateful heart give thanks to the Holy One give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son and now let the weak say I am strong let 
the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give God bless you all this, folks. Have a blessed week. Thank you. Bye now.